This is the second part of a long lecture on Meirun, or Beautiful Women Paintings in China, uh, which I identified at the beginning of the first part as the subject of my interest and research. And I'm pretty much the only scholar anywhere to have shown this interest and done the research, uh, at least until very recently. The lecture is based partly on an introductory essay that I've written for the catalog of an exhibition of Meirun paintings that Julia White and I have organized for the Berkeley Art Museum to be shown later in this year, 2013. In the first part, among other big matters, I talked about the sexual iconography, as I called it, uh, that is used in these paintings, by which innocent-looking objects could be recognized once you knew the code as standing in for erotic images that the artist couldn't depict, at least not in these paintings. Chinese erotic paintings, which were more open in representing genitalia and se sexual couplings, make up a different genre, and mostly took the form of albums, at least among extant, extant examples. These will be the subjects of another lecture in the future. We continue now with the one on Meiran. This painting from the Nelson Atkins Art Museum of a woman holding a finger citrus, or a Buddha's hand fruit, with a dish of them on the table beside her, and gazing out provocatively at the viewer, has been a favorite of mine for many years because it introduces so well that large area of research raised by these paintings and still a little explored, that is, uh, sexual iconography, as they call it, and visual metaphors or stand-ins, how an innocent image can be made to read as a less innocent one, in this case the Buddha's hand fruit standing for the woman's genitals, as I showed in part one. Scholars of Chinese popular literature, drama, and novels have worked more in this area than we painting specialists have, and their findings, of course, apply many of them to our paintings. Next. I used to put beside the Nelson Atkins painting this image of the upper part of a painting of Eve, of Adam and Eve, that is, by the early 16th century German artist Hans Baldung Grün, a pupil of Dürer who painted a great many nude female images. But because they were taken to represent Eve, they were all accepted as religious paintings, even while their male viewers enjoyed them in quite unspiritual ways. The two faces are remarkably similar. She cocks her head a, uh, a bit sideways and smiles slightly, looking provocative. The Chinese uh, painted the nude woman less often, although it was not unknown in China, as we'll see later. Next. Another European painting that I used to put beside it sometimes in slide lectures, including my Getty lectures delivered in Los Angeles, Berkeley, and New York at the Metropolitan, uh, is this one by Jan Stein as another example of displacement, showing the forbidden by way of a non-erotic object. For this one, I used to say that the proper caption might be, Want to eat my oyster? Next. Also in the Getty Lectures, uh, in the fifth lecture that I had, uh, I had a long section on these displacements, I would show finally this painting, an oil portrait of his wife Pang Pang by one of the oil painters at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing that was included in their famous or infamous or notorious exhibition of nude oil paintings. And I would point out that the artist, while he is uh, he has his wife, Pong Pong, holding her hands modestly over the forbidden part, subverts her purpose by showing nearby, in a dish, peaches with just that cleft in them. And I would use this to demonstrate, as I put it, the awesome continuity of Chinese culture. Uh, the artist probably had no idea that he was following a centuries-old practice. Next. Certain flowers, especially the peony, can also serve to represent uh, the same as the Buddha's hand fruit, the woman's genitals. The woman in this well-known picture in the Freer Gallery, who may be Cui Ying Ying of the Western Garden drama, is presenting herself to her lover by giving him a flower, while her maid, uh, Hong Yang, uh, beside her. The painting is the one that opens the last chapter of my book. Of course, we couldn't borrow it for our exhibition because the Freer doesn't lend. Uh, the three people in it are, as I say, the heroine Cui Ying Ying, her lover, uh, scholar Zhang, and her maid Hong, Hong Yang, 
who plays a major role in the drama. The faces of these two lovers, turned toward each other and resembling each other, writers on Chinese representations of lovers have remarked on how they often look very much alike. Looked at by the viewer who is familiar with this sexual iconography, the interaction of the lovers' hands is powerfully sensuous, especially with the flower between them. A dish full of Buddha's hand fruit on the table below the lovers only underscores this message. This is a good example of how the study of what I call sexual iconography can open up completely new perspectives on old familiar paintings, and how what are usually taken for pictures of innocuous subjects can be loaded with erotic meaning. While the fur painting is on screen, let me point out how, looking beyond the foreground figures into the further room, we see a display case <coughs> with a display case with ceramics and other objects, similar to ones that we saw earlier in one of the paintings in our exhibition. Such details increase the viewer's visual pleasure, along with the rich textiles and objects that the paintings offer. Next. Also closely related to the Fuhrer painting, quite possibly by the same artist, or at least from the same studio, is this painting of the Bodhisattva Guanyin with the Child, a, a Buddhist work in the Indianapolis Museum of Art that I reproduced in my vernacular painting book as figure 4.29. It will be in our exhibition as a special kind of Meiran, Guanyin in feminine form, according to some uh, accounts, used her beauty to entice men towards spiritual enlightenment. Here she is watching a child who's reaching out for a white bird. This and a few other related paintings make up a group that I discussed in an article titled, quote, A Group of Anonymous Northern Figure Paintings of the Chenlung Period, which was published in the commemorative volumes for Wenfong's retirement, titled Bridges to Heaven, but which can also be found on my website under Writings of James Cahill in larger type and with the illustrations large and in color, which they aren't in the festival. Next. Another example in our show that features the woman holding a flower and a fan, although not so provocatively, is this one from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. She holds the small flower up close to her lips and her fan down over the seat the seat she is sitting on. But this is not nearly so explicit in its message as another that will be on our show. Next, please. An important and little-known work by the Manchu artist Man Ku Li in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, a picture of a seated woman holding a fan. This one also figured often in my lectures, since it offers an excellent example of this phenomenon of displacement or making an innocent image stand in for what cannot be shown. When the woman in this painting holds a translucent fan over that area of her body, and we see painted on it the long leaves of bamboo, and beneath it her long tapering fingers, we can have no doubt about the artist's intent, in the context, that is, of what we see in all the other paintings with similar passages. This one alone might be given an innocent reading. Next. Similarly, the eight beauties seen in the eight-foot-wide painting by Han Hua Shran, which will be one of the stars of our exhibition, and which I used on the cover of my book, these women are not, as they were once described, the eight consorts of the artist Tang Yin, but prostitutes on the balcony of a brothel, beckoning to potential customers. And the way they hold their hands and the things they hold in them are to be understood in that context offering their sexual favors to men, or to, or to women actually, some of whom also frequented these brothels. That there are no easily accessible literary sources that supply us with readings for such details and paintings is only one part of the large taboo that has existed against writing about these aspects of Chinese painting, or about non-literati or popular painting more generally. It's a taboo that I have spent decades of my life trying to lift without getting as much support as I would have liked from my learned colleagues next. The inscription on this painting supplies a date, 1736, and the name of the artist, a small master named Hua Shan, who was active in Wuxi, not far from Suzhou. 
I saw the painting first after learning about it from a New Year's card sent by the Hong Kong dealer Gerald Godfrey. I saw it in the living room of a Boston row house. The owner, a man, had moved the door of his living room to make a wall long enough for the painting, and he placed a mirror on the opposite wall so that as one came in, one saw it immediately in reflection on entering the room, that is. He had his favorite among the eight women, the second from the left, and she is also also mine. She looks out at us with open invitation, some flowers tucked behind her ears, one little finger touching her lips in a gesture that for some reason is especially beguiling for Chinese men. We see it frequently in these paintings. I'll be happy when our exhibition opens and I can, ha ha, encounter her again. Next. Also subject to that taboo has been the large question of the female nude in Chinese painting. I could cite learned writings, one of them by an old friend, about the absence of the nude from Chinese painting. I cite them and then give my response around the end of my, my, my pic Pictures for You Some Pleasure book. Many examples of nude women could, of course, be collected from Chinese erotic paintings, but they are also to be seen in depictions of old historical subjects, such as the precious consort Yang Guifei from the Tang Dynasty, uh, Yang Guifei bathing, spied on by the Tang Emperor Minghuang, in a painting that I reproduce in that book, page, uh, page 11, detail, page 192, and that I believe from its style to be by Gu Jianlong. The, uh, the Tang Emperor is said to have developed a lust for her. She was the wife of someone else. When he accidentally, or perhaps deliberately, spied her bathing in the Huaqing Spring pool at, uh, <coughs> at uh, Chang'an. The painting is in the Fuji Yudinkan and is there described, ascribed to an anonymous Ming master. But to me, it appears to be a fine work by Gu Lung, and I published it as that. I reproduce this detail near the end of my vernacular painting book in the brief section devoted to examples of the nude woman in Chinese painting. Yang Guifei turns her head slightly and smiles, indicating that she's aware of being watched, a uh, subtly, subtlety that increases the erotic charge that the painting carries. Next. I've assembled over the years a number of images of paintings in which the woman wears a translucent robe that partly reveals her body under it. Here is one in a Japanese collection by Long Mei, uh, which is said to represent a certain Long Tong Yu, whom I can't identify. Next. This one is by the 18th century Yangzhou artist Kong Tao, a specialist in figure painting, and it portrays Yang Guifei emerging from her bath stately in a slightly translucent red robe, attended by a eunuch and a girl servant. One has to look hard at this one to see the body beneath the robe. But if such a painting were hanging in the Chinese room, of course the owner and his friends uh, would have lots of time to gaze at it and be mildly aroused. Next. Paintings of this kind showing women emerging from the bath, wearing translucent robes, testify to the continuing attraction uh, of the partly revealed female body for Chinese and presumably mostly male viewers. Even such a painting as this small picture in our exhibition, a work that I bought long ago very cheap in Japan, can be added to the group carrying mildly erotic implications, aroused by the idea of seeing a forbidden sight, the woman in her bedroom her white body emerging from the loose robe she wears, the hang hangings over the bed, translucent and somehow revealing. The painting now belongs to the Berkeley Art Museum. I gave it to them. Next. We have included also on our exhibition two paintings representing women in the bath or about to bathe, so similar in style and subject that they might well be by the same artist. This one is in the Chicago Art Institute and it was shown to me somewhat hesitantly as a work they had re received as a gift and were not especially proud to own. But it served nicely my purpose of demonstrating the wrongness of this notion that the Chinese didn't represent the female nude. And I reproduced it near the end of my book after the detail of Yang Guifei bathing that we just looked at. She sits on a bench next to the bathtub, perhaps preparing to bathe. 
looking, holding a translucent robe over her body, about to take it off. Her crossed hands are poised to sweep it aside. From pictures such as this, we can begin to understand the Chinese ideal for the female body. I devoted a longish section of my Getty lectures to this and write about it more briefly in my vernacular painting book. It's not at all the same as the European ideal female body. Her face seems, like those of other women we've seen in these paintings, both inward and aware of being watched. This was doubtless part of the appeal of these paintings, the woman's complicity uh, in the voyeuristic act. The quality of the drawing, quite up to the level of other Mayron paintings, reveals that the artist, whoever he was, was the equal in technique of those who painted less arousing pictures. Next. Later, I noticed in a publication of paintings owned by the Dutch collector Ferry Bertolet, who specializes in collecting erotic Chinese paintings, another picture so similar in style and subject that the two would appear to be by the same master. Neither has any signature or seal. It may well be that the artist preferred to remain anonymous to escape possible prosecution for painting pictures of this kind. Both paintings will be in our exhibition. I assume hanging side by side. I like to think of them as gazing out at these learned sinologues who have explained to us at length why the Chinese never painted the female nude. And they're saying, we may not be nude by your definition, but we ain't got much clothes on either. That's for sure. Next. I'll conclude this section of my lectures with one more painting in our exhibition, anonymous, but another that belongs loosely to the group associated with Lung Mei. I have a special fondness for it because it too was once mine, bought long before I thought of studying Mei Run seriously. In fact, I can't remember where and why I bought it, except that I liked the woman and her situation. It was my introduction to the 18th century type that presents the woman in her boudoir as if seen through a doorway, and as if making herself accessible to the male viewer. She's reaching over to snuff out the lamp. My caption for this one was always, shall I turn out the light or will you? I conclude my catalog essay with these words, quote, and so I end this essay with apologies to any who began reading it expecting a sober and scholarly discourse. I hope that after reading it, you will return to our exhibition with newly opened eyes and perhaps newly aroused liberal expectations, finding subtly erotic messages in the paintings along with their sheer beauty and high artistic quality that they also display and deliver. In doing so, you will help to fulfill a wish that I have held for many years, as does this exhibition as a whole." End quote. And that and that ends this part of this video lecture based on my catalog essay for the exhibition. From here on, I'll be showing more images of Mehran paintings and related materials in no particular order to bring out some types and issues. Next. Some information about Mehran paintings, how they were used, how enjoyed, can be found in Chinese fiction and other literature. I've, I quote some of those in my last chapter, and more could be added. For instance, the story of a man who was so much in love with the woman in the painting that she comes to life, comes out of the painting, and gratifies his desires. Some of these references are discussed in my Getty lectures, in my text. But the best work on the treatment of women in Chinese fiction has been done by Judith Zeitlin, seen here in a photo taken when she received a Guggenheim Award. Her writings are to be strongly recommended. She's a good friend and has helped me with my research. Next. There will be one or two paintings in our exhibition that depict groups of women doing something. This is one from the Walters Gallery in Baltimore, in which they are repairing robes. On the whole, we have left these out because they introduce another whole set of issues. Next. This one is included mainly because it's in our own collection and needn't be borrowed. I myself gave it to the Berkeley Art Museum some years ago. It's by a minor late Ming artist named Zhang Yin, and it represents a lady with her servants in a garden. She's washing her hands after doing something, maybe playing a game. I've used it in my studies of early Nanga painting in Japan to represent the kind of minor Chinese painting 
that the early Nanga masters were able to see, at a time long before paintings by the major Mingqing masters began to come to Japan. I remember very well how I bought it. You know, I visited the dealer, uh, the, uh, the store, that is, of the dealer uh, Yabamoto Soshiro in Tokyo, and he was absent. His helper phoned him and was told, show Professor Cahill that painting that we just bought. And the helper showed me the wrong one, this scroll, which they had acquired in order to use the mounting materials, uh, more or less uh, discarding the painting, use them to mount another more valuable painting, that is. I bought it for very little, and I used it, as I say, in my writings on early Nanga. Next. Continuing with pictures of women indoors, here is one from the St. Louis Art Museum that will be in our show, representing a woman and her little boy in a bamboo grove. Those of you who can read the label see that it's attributed to the early figure master Zhou Wanju, but that's an absurd attribution. It's a work of the late Ming or early Qing date. Paintings acquired early by collectors such as Freer were typically ascribed to famous early masters but stripping away all those old attributions doesn't diminish the value of the paintings in any way. They can still be quite fine as anonymous works of later date. Next. This is another that will be in our exhibition, borrowed from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. A woman seated in her study in a bamboo chair. I used to own a pair of chairs just like this one. Uh, she turns to gaze out at the viewer pensively, pausing from her reading. Literary women were especially attractive to the male viewers of these paintings. They could commune with them on an intellectual as well as a sexual plane. This is equally true in our society. Woody Allen had a funny story titled The Whore of Mensa in, uh, about a call girl service you could phone and get a Vassar girl who would come and discuss Kierkegaard with you. The detail reveals further refinements. The soft gray pattern on the, her robe the ink landscape designs on her cuffs. Again, these are paintings that repay close looking. Next. This one included in our show is another that I gave to the BAM. I bought it for very little in an auction in San Francisco, not a painting that anyone else wanted, and some damage in the upper part further reduced the value. The woman sits holding a fan with a design of Narcissus on it, probably another hidden illusion, but one that I can't explain. This one, another in our show that will be borrowed from the Nelson Atkins, depicts a lady pausing from her embroidering uh, to gaze out at the viewer. The figure style and the high quality of the whole suggest the hand of Lung Mei. Pay attention to the spaciousness of the scene, the three-dimensional treatment of the furniture, the deep recession into a further room. Larry Sickman bought several paintings of this kind for his museum, but they were not considered of sufficient quality and importance by later people to become part of the main collection. And they were hidden away after his death, where they could scarcely be found. In this, as in so many other ways, he was way ahead of his time, bless him. Next. This is another unusually high quality Mehran painting that we're borrowing for our show from the Peabody Essex Museum in Boston. A museum that uh, uh, that houses mainly folk art and other materials outside the fine art category. But this, when one spends time with it, proves to be a painting of extraordinary interest. If we can, uh, if we can drop our modernist prejudices against realism and high finish in painting. The woman sits at a table beside a large window overlooking the garden. She holds a brush between the fingers of her right hand and some kind of card or sheet of stiff paper in her left hand. We are to suppose that she is writing a love letter. A cat on the seat behind her looks down at one of two dogs on the floor. Her tiny feet, in red slippers, push out from beneath her skirt. Here, too, the rendering of volume and space is remarkable. Depending on illusionistic techniques, partly learned from European pictures earlier in the Qing, but highly developed by the Chinese professional masters. The literati painters, of course, scorned them and would reject such a painting because it displays no brushwork, no traces of the hand of the artist, uh, who here has thoroughly obliterated his hand that it appears almost like a work of nature. Next. 
a pair of large paintings in the Princeton Art Museum that we decided in the end not to borrow and include in our show since they would have required expensive uh, remounting. The one at left, representing a scholar and his beauty seated in a garden with blossoming peonies, I reproduced in my vernacular painting book as figure 5.10. The other one, representing a woman having her hair done, I didn't know about until later. The left one served my purpose well in representing the scholar-beauty pairing and the robust beauty of the peonies, very symbolic and sexy. Next. In the second chapter of my book, in a section on painting of the imperial court, I reproduced and discussed this work by the court artist Jin Ting Biao, another painting of extraordinary finish and refinement. The lady is seen in her richly appointed chamber, accompanied by a servant. She's putting a flower in her hair, perhaps preparing to answer a call by the emperor. Beauties in imperial court painting make up another subcategory of Meiran painting. Next. This is a painting by the 19th century master Run Xiong, a painting that was my own, but recently was among the group of paintings that I gave away to, my, to one of my sons, Julian Cahill. The other of the twins, Benedict, was given a group of equal value. They were shown the paintings, that is, and then made their choices. Um, Julia and I decided not to uh, have our exhibition go into the 19th century, into the later period, because it would open up too much additional material that we'd have to consider. So the period covered by our show ends around the end of the Shenlong area, late in the 18th century. If we had included Ren Xiong, moreover, we would have had to deal with his uses of old styles. Here are the style of the late Ming figure master Chen Hongshou. The Meiran paintings of our exhibition are mostly free of any such stylistic illusions, another aspect of them that made them beneath contempt for the literati. They would hang the lovely ladies on the wall of their room, that is, and enjoy them as Meiran, as pinups, so to speak, but not as paintings that they could include in their collections and be proud of. Next. Here is one more Meiran that will be on our exhibition, a picture of a standing lady who's holding some small round red object in one hand, a pill of some kind maybe, and a red box in the other. I have no idea uh, what she is holding or doing, and I have nothing to say about the painting except to admire the colorful costume. Next. Finally, if I were to move beyond Meiran proper and into Chinese paintings of women more generally, it would open up a larger set of interesting uh, issues and types that are outside the scope of this lecture. Here, for instance, is a painting that I know only from an auction catalog by Gu Lung, portraying two women sitting by a stream, the younger one holding a book and reading from it, the older one behind her with her arm around her. This is one of the paintings that raise the issue of same-sex relations or lesbian relations between women. This was a subject treated in my lectures and also in my book on Chinese erotic painting but it's outside the range of proper Meiran painting, and I can only say that I will include it, along with a diversity of other themes, in a future lecture on Chinese paintings of women more generally. And saying that ends the second part of this long lecture, as delivered by a long-time devotee of beautiful women paintings and of beautiful women who can still enjoy the paintings, if not the women fixed up visually. James Cale. Thank you.